I don't do this too often. It was asked by Evan, so I went for it. Appreciate that. Preached in uh, Pearl Harbor Church of Christ back in about 2009. It was kind of cool. Preached in a little Christian church not too long ago. And when I was in Colorado Springs, I preached in another, I don't know, I was asked to do something for the training center. And uh, so I, I like this opportunity. I tend to be a teacher more than a preacher, so bear with me while I switch around with different things here because that's kind of what I'm used to. And a coach. I'm used to being outside or on a deck. And um, this, this job right here is not easy. Leading singing is not easy. This is not easy. Um, I want to say something about Evan before he's, he's not here. You guys are, this is a, a church who has something good going with a good preacher. And here's why. Whether you agree with him or not, he studies. Okay? So if he's got something that you, you bring to him, whether angry or not, you know what he does? He doesn't sit there and, now he may have used to do it, and he talks about how he used to be a little stubborn, but he goes back and studies it. And I know that because I brought a few things to him, and he studied them. And he has not told me he studied them, but he goes and reads, and he's on his knees, I can tell. So that's a good thing. We're, we're pretty lucky here. Um, I think that's, let me go back to my notes here. I get a tiny bit nervous up here, so if I keep turning to my notes, it's because I don't want to ramble. I've got the gift of gab. I will go on forever about things. I was on the phone with the unemployment office in LA County, or the state, I think. Lifeguarding on the beach in Malibu was a summertime job. I loved it. Best job I've ever had when it comes to worldly. Surfed all the time. Get to walk on the beach and work full time in my feet. No shoes. Dream. But in the winter, it shuts down. And if you've been to LA, the water's cold. So there's not people hanging out on the beach in the wintertime. So it really shuts down in November. You get some Santa Ana winds. It'll keep it open a little bit. People come out once in a while. But really, out of about two and a half miles of beach at Zuma Beach, you might guard it in the middle of the winter with one or two people. So all of northern section might have four people on guard. And then if it rains, it's shut down. So I have to find something else in the, in the winter. So a lot of people took out unemployment, wrote down their hours that they worked for the county, and then that extra is supplemented by the government. I'm not very proud of that. But I did it for a very short time to see how it worked, and I knew that where people were really lofting off the system. So I was on the phone with this guy. I had just driven up to Mammoth with a friend to get a job ski patrolling up in Mammoth. And uh, I was going to live with a couple of lifeguards. One was LA County, another one was a state guard in Newport, and we became pretty good friends. When I took myself off in unemployment, you just kind of let it lapse. You get a little thing, you fill it out how many hours you worked, and then you send it in. I didn't go to the meeting I was supposed to go to, and that's why I got the call. I wasn't being against it. I just got another job at Mammoth, and the guy called me up, and he goes, Mr. Kite, uh, you missed your meeting last night. Is there a reason why you missed your meeting? Yeah, I got a job. Drove up to Mammoth, California, got a job. Okay, well, um, you, you should have been at the meeting because last night I said, what is the meeting for? What's it about? Um, we teach people how to get jobs. <laughs> okay, well, I got one, so I don't have to worry about the meeting, right? Is that right? Pause. <laughs> and what's running through my mind is, how many people have he, has he actually had a conversation with that didn't go to a meeting who actually got a job and is going to start the next Monday? <laughs> and he said, but you should. Okay, Mr. Kite, well, you have a nice day. I hope everything goes well for you. Click. <laughs> he just wasn't. He was so used to talking to these people that were lofting off the system. Go to their meeting, get their check. I was making $330 a week unemployment. So $1,300, you know. If you're living with your parents like I was at the time, I, that's a pretty good amount. You know, that's all extra for me. I didn't have to rent. I didn't have to do that stuff. They were working at Pepperdine. 
So it was kind of, it wasn't easy for them, but it was a lot easier than buying a $2 million house, which was comparable to our house, but it was held in by Pepperdine, so they kept the prices low. It's kind of a cool little system. So I was asked to speak about Labor Day, and um, because Labor Day is tomorrow. So, and this is um, a, a neat thing, a unique thing about Jesus is a lot of the things that we see and the uh, beliefs we have about Jesus come from art, come from stories we've been told, things from secular side of stuff, and they just don't add up to what Jesus' life was. Jesus is portrayed in art as what? I'll just, I'll just say it. A, a long-haired, um, tree-hugging hippie freak. Okay? He's got this hair down to here. He's got no muscles. He's just weak. And he's, look, a lot of artists portray him that way, and I'm not really sure why. Have you ever shaken the hands of a carpenter? Raise your hand if you work in carpentry or contracting or do stuff with wood all the time. Mel, over here. You guys shaking their hands? Calloused, strong. You're like, ah, I got to get in there fast because if I don't get in there fast, they're going to crunch me right here. So I got to be really careful. That's what Jesus did. But guess what, guys? He had no power tools. He didn't get to use a sander. He didn't get to use a, a saw of any kind. Strong hands. So I'm sure that he could hold his own in a fight. He wasn't a fighter. We understand that. But I'm sure that he was strong. Okay. I was working for a guy one time in Lubbock. And he said, hold this board. And he was holding it like that. And he had been in contracting for 20 years. He had it with one hand. And I went, okay. Ooh, boom. <laughs> right down to the ground. And I was already strong at that time. He just so strong in his arms and stuff, he could just grab things and go. That's one thing that's a little bit different than we portray Jesus as. Okay? When we're looking at the Bible and who Jesus was, we don't exactly, I think, portray him the right way when it comes to Christianity and work. There's other things you can talk about. But this right here, this thing I'm going to specifically talk about, is kind of throws us for a loop a little bit. In the verse we read, Lowell, thanks for reading that verse. I did switch it on you at the last minute. I don't know if you had it before, but I switched it last night. Because I wanted this verse down, this 2 Thessalonians 3. And the, what we're talking about here is toil and labor for Christ. So 2 Thessalonians 3, and I'm going to read 6 through 14, or 15, I think. And I like this from the RSV. Are we up and going? Yeah. Okay. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they receive from us. This is powerful. It doesn't say, you know, go hang out with them. It says keep away from them. Now, this is Paul writing to the Thessalonian church, second letter. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you, and we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but the toil and labor we worked day and night, so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because, of, <clears throat> because we do not have the right but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even we were with you, for even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. Now that's the, twi that's the tweet. That's Jesus' or Paul's tweet right there, okay? Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now, such persons we command and extort in the Lord Jesus Christ, to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary of doing what is right. Take note of those who do not obey what we say in this letter. Have nothing to do with them so that they may be ashamed. 
Do not regard them as enemies, but warn them as believers. Okay? We learn from Paul in Corinthians, don't judge those outside the church, but go ahead and rebuke those and help those within the church. Lovingly please. Okay? When I look at this verse, it kind of blows me away because we're kind of this idea, and I'll get to this in a little bit, and this will get a little political, and I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to go both sides as much as possible, okay? Because I don't want to sit here and preach from one side. That's not what this is about. What we're getting to is love and Christianity and working and working together. We work in order to give an example that you can imitate, okay? the main thing, what, what I like there. Now, Paul, again, like Jesus, was a strong man. What was his, his um, thing that he did? Tent maker. <clears throat> okay. Now, they weren't working with North Face tents that you pick up like this with one hand, and it weighs four pounds, and you put it up, and five people can stand in it. Okay. They weren't working with that. This stuff was thick. You ever seen the army tents in the uh, First and Second World War? And the canvas they used, I expect the tents were a lot worse because they were using skins and other things. So it's pretty heavy stuff. And they're sewing needles through this. I've used a leather awl. And if you, don't, if you, if you hit that thing wrong, going through a thick piece of leather, it'll go right through your finger. It's not easy. You get calloused up. So Paul is making sure we know that we should work. And at the same time, kind of comes back and says, though we don't need to, giving the missionaries, giving the preachers, the ability to be paid by the church, and that's okay. But he's trying to set an example here. And he's working, and he's traveling, he's doing everything, so he's staying up a lot and, and working hard to get this thing done. Okay. Then he gives a command. There's not many commands in the New Testament. There's not many times when Jesus says, do this or else. There's not In the Old Testament, it's all over the place. But Paul gives this command, and anyone who does not work should not eat. Okay, there's that tweet right there. That's the, that's the craziness right there. That's where we go. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is not how the world works right now. This is not how the world works. Okay. It doesn't seem like a very Christian concept to say to someone, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. I'll move on to the next slide. There are those, including myself, who seem to lack a little bit of sense. <laughs> and I'll put this in my category and I'll explain myself here. In this next part, I want to look at Proverbs 12, 11. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. The reason I put myself in a little bit of this category is because I tried really hard for a long time to make the Olympics in running and then triathlon. I trained hard until I was 37 years old. I don't think it's a complete loss because it's not. Because, I mean, look where I, I'm working a full-time job. I'm at Point University, swim coaching, and that's a good thing. Okay, I've got my family here. I'm here with you guys because of it. If I had made the Olympics, I probably would have made a lot more money. I probably would have been you know, in an NCAA Division I school somewhere. I think God held me back from making it for a reason. And I think he wanted me at a small Christian school being with a church like you guys. Okay? I don't think that, I think that when people get set off, I, I don't think I was mature enough. I talk to my wife about this a lot. Kind of glad I didn't make it. Look at my family. I wouldn't trade those guys in for a gold medal. Maybe, maybe three gold medals, but no, no. I would not do it. Once Jacob, once we had Jacob, it just changes everything. This wasn't a lucrative thing that I was pursuing. And it probably didn't set my life up the best. I probably could have gotten a master's, done something else. But again, if I would have gotten a master's, I may not be here. So. He who follows worthless pursuits lack sense. And I think that kind of goes with that don't be a busybody kind of thing. If you're making a little trinket and try to sell it and it's not selling and it's not going and it doesn't get up and head, get steam and go, don't stay with that. You know, move on to something else. 
Okay, let's look at Luke 19, 12 through 26. This is where Jesus is talking. He said, therefore, a nobleman went, it, this is a parable. A nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that might know what they had, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him saying, Lord, your menia has made me 10 more menias. And he said to him, well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in very little, you shall have authority over 10 cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, your menia has made me five menias. And he said, great, you're now over five cities. Then another came, saying, Lord, here's your menia, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you do not, did not sow. And he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. And he said to those who stood by, and here's the part, here's the tweet. Take the minya, the minya from him and give it to the one who has ten minyas. Here's their answer. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. Why are you giving it to him? I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has been, has will be taken away. That's a hard one too. That right there, that verse is weird because it, it seems like this guy is suffering or, or this guy is one of the people he's talking about in the Sermon of the Mount, a little bit. This guy doesn't have anything. But I think the point here is different. The point here is work. Yes, he wants people to gain more. This is capitalism. This is free market. This is whatever you want to call it. This is Jesus saying, you've got to do this. And they say, well, let's spread the wealth. Let's take that out of the media and spread the wealth. Nope, nope. Give it to the one who has more. Okay, so that's the part that gets me every time going, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Okay. There are two ways to look at this. One is in the real sense of menias. Why did he use money here? Where in the Matthew version, he used talents. I like the talents better. Talents is easy because you can say, well, that's really not a monetary unit. That is a talent that I have. I'm a swim coach. I'm not going to bury that talent. I'm going to go and coach swimming. And then what I'm going to do is try to convert people from that standpoint. That's the gist of what we're getting at here. But this right here is actually using menias. Maybe it's the crowd he was talking to. Maybe he knew their love of money. I don't know. But the point here is we can take this in a real sense and we can take this in a spiritual sense. The real sense is... Go, work. It's not bad to make money. It's not bad. It's not a bad thing. This is not against Christianity. It's not against Jesus. Now, be careful because you've got the eye of the needle problem. Okay? Harder for a rich man to go to heaven than through the eye of a needle. I've always said, well, that's a needle. That's a, that's a city gate that you can't, you got to duck the cow, I mean, the, the camel down and try to get him through that small opening in the city gate called a needle. I mean, whether it's a needle that pricks you and, and you use it to sew, or it's a needle in a city gate, it's, it's hard to get through to heaven. But he wraps that up at the end of that verse and says, but anything's possible with God. And what he's saying is, you're going to need my blood to do it. That's what he's saying. You're going to need a covenant with, with God through my blood. 
Okay? And then the other sense is the spiritual sense. You're going back to the talent or the menia or this, what I would call Christian capitalism. Okay? There's a whole bunch of people in this world who sit on their Christianity and don't talk about Christ. There's a whole lot of people that put it on Evan. A whole lot of people. There's a lot of churches out there that... Guys, Evan's not in charge here. He is a leader, and he's teaching us, but the elders are in charge here. You know, And, and I was going to say this at first, and I kind of forgot it. Let's, let's, let's take up some slack here. I'm going to take up some slack. I'm going to teach these kids. Let's, let's get after it in this church because we need these kids to learn. And not only that, but we've got a very small youth group. Let's build it. You know, We were doing a great job over the summer building it, and it was awesome. It was fun, even through this really hard time that we're going through the last, what, 18 months or something that we've been dealing with this. Okay. We can go back to, and I'll turn to it real fast, to the Acts story. This is how I'm not going to take one side or the other with this situation. At the end of Acts 2, after the, Peter's first sermon, what did they do? Okay, let me make sure I didn't skip anything over here. Acts 2, 43 through 47. After all these guys have been baptized, and women also, what, 3,000 men that day, and probably a lot of women and kids, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were, got, were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and be, uh, belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, day by day, those who were being saved. Okay? This is probably where you get the communist or socialist side when there's Christians that just believe you've got to go all in with communism and socialism. This is the verse right here. A little bit after this, Jesus said a whole lot of things that were, you need to give to the poor. James talk, talks about taking care of widows and orphans, true religion. So we see the other side of it. Here's the deal. And I'll get to this a little bit later when we read the next verse. Which one's right, which one's wrong? If you have a covenant with God, you've got a covenant with God. You're together. The ultra, ultra liberals, the ultra, ultra conservatives or libertarians, if they've got a covenant with God, they need to be meeting together. We need to be together. Because one day we're going to be together in heaven. And this is all going to be a joke to us. I'm thinking we look back and say, I can't believe I worried about whether Trump or Biden should be president. Because we'll be laughing about it. Yes, I've, we've got the things we're worried about, and we've got the things that we need to do, and there's taxes, and we shouldn't give this much taxes, and then there's Jesus saying, whose face is on the coin? We'll give to Caesar what's Caesar's, because that's his coin. You know, there's so many different sides of it. The basic point here is we've got to come together. We've got to work hard in our secular life and in the church. And then we've got to be brothers and sisters together. So let's look at Galatians real fast. Galatians 3, 27, 29. Trying to keep an eye on the time here. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ... There is neither Jew or Greek. There is neither slave or free. There is no male or female, for you are all in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female. This does not give us an excuse to have slaves. It makes us work if we are slaves. 
because we're supposed to do what they said, what Jesus said, what Paul said. It does not give us an excuse to have a male over female or the other way around. We all need to work and we all have jobs. Republican or Democrat, I'm going to add these. These are not in the Bible. When it comes to Christianity, there's no difference in the two. Communists or capitalists, conservatives or liberals, vaccinated or unvaccinated. Okay? It all comes down to having a covenant with God and working as if you're working for the Lord. Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. If you truly go to work thinking, I'm going to do today for God and for Jesus, you're going to affect someone's life, whether you think you are or not. If you truly go to work for a master because you're a slave and you have a great attitude like, oh, was it Esther? Which one was the slave? Not Queen Esther, it was the other one. Oh, shoot, I forgot. Oh, no, 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 it was Naaman's slave. Naaman's slave. Naaman was the, was the military commander who had leprosy, who went to see Elisha. And he had a, a, an Israelite slave girl who said, Master, why don't you do what he said? If it wasn't that simple voice, focused on God, he wouldn't have known to just go ahead and dip himself in the river seven times. He wanted to see lightning bolts and, and eagles fly across the sky and bears appear, swat him across the face and get rid of his leprosy. Now, go, go dip yourself in the Jordan seven times. Matthew 28. I gotta find where I am on here real fast, guys. What is our work? I'm gonna say real fast because I forgot this. I made a note on it. This should supersede any of our professional work that we do. This is my job first and foremost. No matter what I'm doing, this is my job. There is no other reason to be here, guys. People are searching, and Ponce de Leon searched for the fountain of youth for how long and went around the southeastern U.S. and Florida and all these places when he didn't know it was right here, the fountain of youth. Guess what, guys? We conquered death. Jesus conquered death. He won. He already won. We know where we're going. This is a beautiful thing. 28. And I'm going to point out a little bit here. This is really cool. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded and commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He was talking to a small group, but he knew it would be written down like that. It was written down in Mark also. He didn't tell them to be baptized. Do you ever even see that in that verse? He didn't look at him and say, you need to be baptized. What he said was, work. Go and baptize. What's more powerful? Baptizing yourself or baptizing 100 people? What's more powerful? Eating the fish yourself or feeding 5,000 people. And that's what he's getting down to here. He's saying, we got to go. We got to do this. Got to go. James says, work is doing. Threskos. Religion is threskos. To do it. Work. Take care of the widows and orphans. Do it. Don't disidemanos, which Luke or Paul was talking about, or Peter, which one was it in, 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 Luke, in Acts 17 when he was at the Areopagus, Paul, and said, I see you guys have, are very superstitious in many ways. That word's not religion, it's superstition. You're very sit on your hands in every way. 
Got that? Don't sit on your hands and pray to an idol or pray to this or pray to that. Go and work. That's true religion. People say, what religion are you? No, that's not what that means. What religion are you? I work. <laughs> that's my religion. I work for God. I work for Jesus. Okay. So the, the, the call to work... Work hard at your career. This is where I'm concluding right here. Work hard at your career, your secular career. Be a good example for those non-Christians to see what you do. I had one of the best compliments yesterday. I had a girl that, did, that put together a road race and all this stuff. And I said, thank you for the work that you did on the group me. And I said, you did an awesome job. This is great. And they were kind of complimenting each other on the thing going on. It's very small. And it was 30 people showed up. But it was a start. It was a go. Do it. And she goes... And she said something that's important. Thank you for being a leader who fears God. And you can start there. No matter what your career, fear God and show them who you are. No matter your beliefs. Sometimes you don't have to say it. Remember, if you have to wear a cross around your neck to show that you're a Christian, be careful with that. Wear your cross around your neck without putting a chain on. Let people see the cross on your neck without wearing a cross. No matter your beliefs, work hard for the Lord. Begin with your interests. Every one of you has something that you love to do. Use that. That's your talent. Find people with the same interests. Pool together and that's who you're talking to. Tell those individuals about Christ. That's the next step. <clears throat> Try to set up Bible study. Try to get here, to get them here to church, whatever you can. Okay? If you're having problems with this or anything in any way, this is a chance right now where you can come forward, speak with me. I probably necessarily wouldn't speak with me. I'll probably push you towards an elder if something like that happened, if you have issues or something. Thank you to my kids for being a little bit quiet today. <laughs> and um, I guess we'll do the invitation song now.